The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. The title of the message today is Hidden with Christ in God. And today we are celebrating the greatest event in history, the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior. The resurrection is the central truth of Christianity. Without the fact of the resurrection, we would not have Christianity. Christianity's claim is that the Creator God Himself came down to earth to reconcile man to God in the person of Jesus, who is both man and God. His human nature was as the Son of Man. His divine nature was God incarnate, the Son of God. And he came as the only begotten Son of God. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, but he did so much more. I would like to share a term with you that you may have never heard before, the high gospel, as opposed to a low gospel. The high gospel preaches what the limitless possibilities are for those of us who've been saved. In other words, the low gospel would be, Jesus came and saved us from our sins, period. The high gospel is that Jesus came as the only begotten son, but then he became the firstborn to bring many sons unto the glory of God. That's the high gospel. That is the real purpose. That is the eternal purpose of God the Father. What the book of Ephesians is all about, that we are his inheritance as overcoming, mighty, bride of Christ, army of God, sons of God, walking in the fullness of all that Jesus paid for us to have. That is the high gospel. The low gospel, when Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, the low gospel would be that when we're, we're stressed or we're troubled, we can run to Jesus and he'll, he'll pat us on the head. The high gospel is Jesus' yoke is doing the will of Father God. Jesus' yoke was to come into and complete the eternal purpose of God for the sake of mankind. The high gospel is that yoke of doing the will of God, entering into the God story. That's the high gospel. So today, I will be speaking high gospel truths to you. Now, without the resurrection of Jesus, Christianity is pointless. It's not positive thinking or a good attitude. Christianity connects our spirit to God's life-giving spirit. We are not mere observers of historical fact. We become partakers of resurrection life, a brand new quality of life, a life with power in it. That is our inheritance in Jesus. Now, the truth is, no other religion makes the claim that Christianity makes. That Christ came out of the grave. If that is not true, the whole religion of Christianity is a false one. But what does this mean to us? What are the implications of the resurrection? First of all, it validates Jesus' claim that he is the way the way, the truth, and the life, period. Jesus' resurrection means that death is defeated once and for all, and we can enter into that victory, and there will be a generation that will not taste death. The resurrection gives us hope for the future, but it offers spiritual life to us right 
now. John 4, 14, whoever drinks of the water that I, Jesus, shall give him will never thirst, but the water I shall give will become in him, in us, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life, which is a brand new quality of life, the very life of heaven itself. Paul himself wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 14 in the Amplified, if Messiah has not risen, then our preaching is in vain. It amounts to nothing, and your faith is empty of truth and is fruitless, without effect, empty, imaginary, and unfounded. The resurrection, then the truth of the resurrection is the central truth of Christianity. Because Jesus did come out of the grave, all of history changed. The ramifications are immense. It tells us that Islam is false. It tells us because Muhammad is dead, but Jesus lives. Hinduism is false. The Bible says there is one life and then comes the judgment. We don't become reincarnated over and over and over again, hoping that we will someday defeat karma. Is that good news or what? I would hate to have to come back here. When I go to be with Jesus, I'm not coming back, I want to tell you. I'm staying there. It tells us that Buddhism is likewise false. New Age is false. Rabbinic Judaism, which rejects Jesus, is incomplete. Because he lives, we live. Jesus said in John 14, 3, I go and make a place for you. And I will come back again and will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. And he was speaking to the disciples and he came back in the spirit to them and they enjoyed fellowship with him and they enjoyed that life, a life connected with heaven on this earth. The whole book of Acts is about the potential for believers who enter that kind of life. And now Jesus came as the only begotten son, but after the resurrection and ascension, he became the firstborn of many sons brought to their potential in God. And how sad it is that the low gospel of Christianity has been preached across this world that we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus and it ends there. That is a low gospel indeed. Thank goodness that people get saved, but oh, the power of the resurrection that's available to us. The next point is partaking of the resurrection. There is a story that, are y'all familiar with Corey Ten Boom? She was a Dutch lady whose family hid Jews in their home. They had a false wall, and when the Nazis came to their country, they would take in Jews and hide them. Eventually, the Ten Boom family was caught, and they were sent to concentration camps, at one of, at one of which the father of the family died, and the sister of Corey Ten Boom died. But God preserved Corey's life, and when she got out, she went to tell the world that no matter what happens, Jesus is deeper still. No matter how deep the hole you're in, Jesus is deeper yeah. still. And one of the books she wrote, many books she wrote, one was The Hiding Place, that's probably the most well-known, but one book was entitled Not Good If Detached. Well, what does that mean? She saw on railway tickets in America that there would be the ticket itself and then a little stub at the end with the number, which is the number of the passenger who was going to get on the train. And on the ticket, it says, not good if detached, meaning from that number, that that proved you had a right to get on the train. And Corey said, connected with him in his love, I am more than a conqueror. Without him, I am nothing. Not good 
is detached. And this is the book about living the abiding life with Jesus, or living with him. You see, we get our ticket and we enter the train, but once we enter the train of the resurrection life of Jesus, the power of the train carries us that there is a power in abiding in him. There is a power in the resurrection. We are branches that abide in the vine. When attached to the vine, its life or his life becomes our life. We don't just celebrate the resurrection as a historical fact. We live the resurrection. We partake of resurrection life in our spirit. Jesus said, I am am the resurrection when we have him we don't just get some resurrection we have resurrection himself and the book of colossians in the bible the whole theme of the book of colossians is it's the epistle of the resurrection colossians 3 2 through 4 says therefore set your mind speaking of your focused attention your exclusive attention Pay exclusive attention to things above, not these things on this earth. This earth is ephemeral. This earth is passing away. This earth is an illusion compared to the reality of the spirit. Set your attention on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was raised, you were raised. When Christ ascended to sit on the throne next to his Father in heaven, you were raised there too. And now your life, it says, is hidden with Christ in God. Resurrection is the essence, nature, and reality of our present Christian life if we receive it by faith and we walk in it. In Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, we read that Jesus is the forerunner that takes us where? Into the heavenly realm, into the holy of holies in heaven itself. He's the forerunner. And it also tells us that he is the captain, a captain is not a captain unless he leads people somewhere. You can't be a captain over nobody. (laughs) Jesus is the captain of many sons that enter into that heavenly holy of holies. He forged the way for us. He cut the way into the glory within the veil in the holy of holies so we can follow him there by remaining attached to him as the precious gems bearing the names of the children of Israel and the 12 tribes, our high priest, Jesus, our Melchizedek, entered the Holy of Holies, bearing us on his heart and on his shoulders. If we're attached to him, when he entered the Holy of Holies, he carried us there too. We are living stones precious stones. We proceed to the heavenly throne by staying attached to our great high priest in the heavenlies. Revelation 3.21 promises us to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We are promised a spiritual life that we can live in now. That's not talking about someday when we go to heaven. That's a quality of life that we can enter into now. This is the place of the power. This is the place of the glory. This is the place of the light. This is the place of the greater works for the army of God and the sons of God. Now, we can stop appropriating the things available to us anywhere we want. We always have a choice. Many people are not interested in going much further than being forgiven and pretty much live their own lives. And it doesn't mean that God won't be with them, that God won't help them, that God won't answer their prayers, that that they're left on their own, that God won't take care of some details in their lives. 
but that's the low gospel. Now, there are three levels of appropriation that we've been teaching for some time, and these are not like spiritual gifts because not everybody gets the working of miracles as a gift. Not everybody gets the word of knowledge as their gift because it's the Holy Spirit who distributes the gifts. But for everybody, we can enter into what Jesus paid for us to have on the cross. And we could enter into everything all at one time, but generally we only see so much in the spirit at any one time. God, because we are, we can't absorb much. I don't know about you, but I find that it takes time to absorb revelation and make it real in my life. First, we have to see it. Then by faith and patience, we inherit the promises. So we hang on and we say, I know this is mine. I know, for example, physical healing in this area is mine. And I believe it, I confess in it, I walk in it, and guess what? It eventually manifests. And as Sid Roth says, a miracle is a sudden healing. A healing is a gradual miracle. Okay, but it's all God's power. And the three levels that we can enter into based on the work of the cross, now, It's through the blood that we're forgiven. And we can stay there. That's the low gospel. That's the forgiven life. The I'm I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, a higher gospel would be Romans 6. It says, I've been freed from the dominion of sin. It has no hold on me. And Romans 7, I am freed from self-effort. It's Christ who lives in me, the living Christ. Not I, but Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The replaced life. And that's for our personal holiness. So we can fulfill God's command to be holy as I am holy. Well, guess what? Only Jesus can be holy. So it takes the living Christ, living holiness in us for us to walk in the replaced life. But there's a higher life than that, and that's a life lived in the kingdom of the heavens, as was mentioned last Sunday, if you were here, that the whole gospel of Matthew is about a new way of living. And that's Jesus came as the king to announce that we can tap into the powers of the age to come and live in the realm of being seated together with Jesus in heavenly places now on this earth. So the New Testament tells us to look at things that are above. Colossians tells us to look at things which are above. See that which is above. See the possibility, see the riches of heaven reserved for us. Every blessing is in in heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing is in heavenly places. Do you want every spiritual blessing? I do too. I don't want just one or two spiritual blessings. I want all that Jesus paid for, for me to have. Every spiritual blessing, but it's in heavenly places. The New Testament begins with the book of Matthew, which introduces a new king has come to town. And his kingdom is a kingdom of the heavens, that there is a new realm that Jesus was forging a way to open up for all of us. A new concept, not just the kingdom of God. This was the kingdom of the heavens that we could access. And he went on and he taught, okay, what a citizen's of the kingdom of the heavens look like. And he gave us the Beatitudes, starting out with poor in spirit. Those who realize without him I can do nothing. Yes. Only what he does counts for anything. All else is religion, dead works, and will someday be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble. Because only Jesus is able to live the Christian life. We are totally useless. We are totally worthless in our flesh. As a matter of fact, we can't then have pride over anything that he does through us because it's not us. And we can't feel bad about ourselves because without him, we're nothing anyway. So what's the point? It's all and everything, only Jesus. 
the book of Revelation on the other end of the New Testament concludes with the description of the kingdom of the heavens and encourages all to enter into that realm of living. This is not heaven to be enjoyed someday in the future after we die. This is heavenly living available for us now. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come! And let him who e hears say to others, Come! Yes. Whoever desires, let him, and he who thirsts, let him come! Whoever desires, are you hungry for God? Let him take the water of life freely. freely. Now the book of Hebrews was written specifically for believers who had seen the possibility of the enthroned life in the heavenly realm. But they were reluctant to pay the price to enter in because as Catherine Kuhlman said with great joy, it will cost you everything. And then she laughs and she said, but I didn't really have anything anyway. <laughs> and that's true of us. Without him, we are nothing, we have nothing, we can do nothing. Hebrews reveals Jesus as our high priest, the one who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens an opened heavens. In the book of Revelation, we see not merely a window into heaven, but a door, a door opened in heaven that never shuts. Heaven was opened to John and he saw a throne set in heaven and one sitting upon the throne. This throne is not simply the throne of grace for salvation, but it's the throne of the fullness of grace. That's the power of Jesus in us, the fullness of what he can do if we let him live his life through us. It's the throne of authority. It's the throne of divine administration. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then boldly come to this throne. Now, we've mentioned that Jesus is our captain, taking us somewhere. And where is that? It's to a place with him in the heavenly realm. For what purpose? The purpose of bringing heaven to earth, releasing heaven on earth. The book of Revelation describes the headquarters in heaven connected to the church embassies on earth. The first vision in the book of Revelation is of Jesus walking in the midst of the golden lampstands. Jesus rebuking and encouraging his churches on earth. The second vision that John sees is what is actually taking place in heaven. And what does he see? He sees that what is happening in the churches on earth are directly related to the activity in heaven because of the transmission from the throne of God in heaven into my spirit, into your spirit. When we enjoy the Lord, we are simultaneously on earth and in heaven. Just as an electric meter can register the transmission of electricity flowing into our homes, flowing into this building here, the seven spirits of God transmit heavenly power into the churches, into the lives of believers. Colossians encourages us not to be distracted by religion or philosophies of men. Forget the heavenly things, culture, religion, philosophy, and natural human virtues, and press on to enter in to heavenly living and keep the power switched, switch turned on. This causes us to be transformed by transmitting a heavenly element into us and we cannot be in the presence of God without being changed. Yes. Even if we can't see the change, it's impossible to be in the presence of God and not be changed. So focus our attention on these things above. Then the riches of Christ's heavenly ministry 
will be transmitted into you and you will be transformed and you will be conformed into the image of our Savior. Now, what do we share together with Jesus? Connected with him in the heavenly realm, we share one position, one life, one living, one destiny, and one glory. Why? Because we're connected to him. Yes. We have not detached ourselves from him. We are living and abiding in him. Because Jesus and I have one position, we are in the spirit where he is. That's the spiritual way that Jesus is. He opened the way so in our spirit we can enter into what he has entered into. We and Jesus have one life together. Zoe life, eternal life, everlasting life, all the same word, Zoe life. It's a different kind of life from the life that this world knows. Moreover, we have one living with Christ. Our living is his living. When we live, he then lives through us and works through us. In a practical way, day by day, whatever we do is what he is doing through us and in us and as us. That means when we talk connected with him, he talks. His destiny is our destiny. The Bible tells us that one day we will share in his glory. We will be in the glory together with him. His destiny is our destiny and his glory is our glory. We don't see it in fullness now, but one day the entire universe will see us in the fullness of the, glo the glory in Christ, in Christ, in the Father, in heaven. Our position is in him. Our position is also in the Father. What we must do is not take this as doctrine, not look to historical fact, but be diligent to enter into the reality. And how do you enter into the reality? First, you see it's there, then you want it. And whatever you see, you can have. And then by faith and patience, we will inherit the promises in this place. Now, there are three characteristics of resurrection life. And we must discern between our natural life and supernatural life. I believe most of you can tell what has an anointing on it in your daily walk. Most of you have a conscience that gives you a red light when you get out of the will of God or start to do something in the flesh. That's the discernment we need to first have to walk in the light as he is in the light. Maintaining our peace. Our new book, Flowing in the River of God's Will, when we have peace, we know we're okay. We have a green light. We lose our peace, we need to make an adjustment somewhere. First, the life we share with Jesus, let's look at Jesus first. Jesus' life was a crucified life. He didn't only experience crucifixion at the end of his life. He lived a crucified life. Not once did he go off on his own and ignore the will of the Father. Not once. This is a life laid down. Second characteristic, it was a resurrected life. Third characteristic, this resurrection life is life hidden in God. A crucified life is unmoved by earthly things. That's one reason the Lord sends people in circumstances our way to see where we can be tempted to come out of the place of resurrection and get busy in the flesh, to right or wrong, to um, straighten somebody out, to change circumstances, to take control and exercise our will. God wants to get out of us all resistance, rebuttals, and rebellion. That's what the crucified life trains us 
in. If we're truly living a crucified life, we don't react when rejected or insulted. Amen. The life we live today should be one that does not get knocked out of the peace by unpleasant people or negative circumstances. But God is so gracious that when we do give in, because, you know, in this life we still have humanity and sinful flesh clinging to us, although Jesus is living through us, and the temptations to react on our own, we are now kept by the power of God. So if we do give in to a temptation, it's quick down, quick up. The Christian life can only be lived step by step. You blow it, receive forgiveness. What did you think you were capable of anyway? <laughs> receive forgiveness and get back up and walk. Yeah. Get right back into the peace. And this resurrection life connects us to a higher realm. It connects us to heaven. And then Hebrews 12, 22 23 and 28 speaks of those who have come to this heavenly place of living, but you have come to Mount Zion, the holy of holies in heaven, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn sons of God who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of of just men made perfect, and that means made perfect in love, which is the way we fulfill the law, just men made perfect, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The Lord of hosts is truly with us, and his kingdom can't be shaken. We're supposed to shake the kingdoms of the earth. We're supposed to be the army. We're to enter into that. We become God's mediators. For him, his ambassadors on earth, and it's through our prayers and our intercession that the kingdoms of the earth become shaken. But we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen. Two, a resurrected life. We have a new life source. Dennis saw a vision when he was a young believer. And have you all ever seen like... Um, thousand, what was it, 10,000 leagues under the sea, 20,000 leagues under the sea, uh, a novel, and they had the, the deep sea divers who had the big helmet and the heavy boots that would, that would take them down to the bottom of the ocean, and they'd walk in a foreign element, the water, but they had an air hose attached to the surface in a ship, and the air from above was pumped down to them in the depths of the sea. Well, it's like we are the deep sea divers. We are now, as citizens of heaven, living in a foreign element of the world. But we have a connection that connects us with the, with the glorious air of heaven above. We have resurrection life to live in. The one life we share with Jesus is a resurrected life. And by the way, when I say resurrection here, I'm including resurrection and ascension. Resurrection life is supernatural power. Nothing, including death, can suppress it. We share one life with our Lord. And as we yield to him, he lives his resurrection life through us. Finally, a hidden life. God's hidden ones live as children of another world because we are truly citizens of another world. That old song, the things of earth become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We have a heavenly perspective. We have the Father's heart of self-giving love. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for others. We lose our self-love and become other lovers. Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Flesh can't do that. That's supernatural. That's our Father's heart. 
And God is preparing even now to release the Father's heart into the bosom of a great company of believers to accomplish his, his will in these dark days in which we live. Only divine life can be hidden in God. Flesh can't approach God. In him we're partakers of this divine life. We are Ephesians 2, 6, seated together with him on his throne in the presence of Father God. We're seated above the things of this world. We are hidden from the enemy. Our home is a hidden place in heaven and divine life is from that place transmitted through us and released to bring glory on earth. And I would like to conclude with an exhortation, Hebrews 12, 1. And we've been talking, we've been singing that song about a thousand, we are joining in the song of a thousand generations. And can't you just feel it during worship? That we are joining with that heavenly throng, with that great cloud of witnesses. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto, unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's go on to join him there. Dennis. Jennifer, explain the breastplate. Okay, Dennis asked me to, to explain the breastplate. Now, in, under the Levitical system, the high priest was the only one who could go into the Holy of Holies, either in the tabernacle in the wilderness or the Holy of Holies in the temple. There were three rooms in the tabernacle and in the temple. The first room was the outer court. And in that, the sacrifices were, were offered. I particularly like the tabernacle in the wilderness because you can see this so clearly. The outer court was open to the light of the natural sun. This represents believers who've been forgiven but have not gone on to depart from the things of the world. The second room, the holy place, has the table of showbread, also the bread of the presence, a lampstand for supernatural revelation, and an altar of incense right before the veil that led into the most holy of place, most holy place. And in the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim and their wings touching above the Ark and the presence and glory of God. The high priest could enter only once a year to atone for the sins of Israel. And by the way, just in case he hadn't gotten himself right with God to approach this throne of God, this mercy seat, it said that there were bells at the hem of his garment. So when, and there was supposedly a rope tied around his ankle so if those bells stopped ringing, they could drag the body out. Right. And by the way, Henry Groover, well, we told this story that there was a congregation, he'd been invited to speak, and they were calling for the glory to come down, and God said, go tell them to stop. And he said, well, you know, I'm a visitor here. The pastor hasn't even introduced me. And God said, tell them to stop. If my glory came down, their sins are so great, half of them would be dead. I believe we're going to walk in a, a, a time of Ananias and Sapphira, fear of the Lord, as the glory comes. But the high priest would wear, representing the children of Israel, Stones, precious stones on his shoulders representing strength. And on it the names of the children of Israel were engraved. And then on the breastplate, on his heart representing his love, there were the stones of the twelve tribes of Israel, precious stones. And the high priest would, in a sense, 
carry the children of Israel into the Holy of Holies on his person, that he was the way that they could uh, figuratively enter into the Holy of Holies. Now Jesus, our great high priest in the heavenlies, carries us as precious stones loved by God, not little um, rough pebbles you'd find in a riverbed, but precious stones. The New Jerusalem is made of precious gems, diamonds, sardis, sapphire, and precious gems. And Jesus carries all his children. He is the way into the very holy of holies when we are attached to him. We do not want to become detached. Not good if detached. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit, spirit with, with him. him. Thank you. Did that bless you like it blessed me? Yeah. I just want to share a little bit about the communion that we're about to partake in. That after they completed the Passover, you know what the Passover represents, correct? All of you know. That Passover, Jesus himself instituted the new covenant. And I find it interesting because it's a table of unity. It's a table of koinonia. It's a table of communion. Not only what the Lord's done for us, but our attitude toward one another. That we are to discern properly the body. Correct? And... What I saw in the scriptures that kind of stood out was we know that Judas partook of that Passover supper, betrayed the Lord, and in John it says, Judas went out and it was night. That table can be a table of separation or it can be a table of communion. The rest of the disciples, it said, as was the custom, went to the Mount of Olives, the place of illumination. So we leave the table of the Lord, illuminated, in union and communion, with a proper heart attitude toward the body. Or it could be a table of separation due to hardness of heart. And by failing to properly discern the body, some are sick prematurely, die prematurely. It's a serious thing, isn't it? To have a proper attitude, not just toward the Lord. You can't say, I love God, but I just hate these Christians. <laughs> right? And so, I saw that that Mount of Olives was the place of revelation. And it really struck me that after the resurrection, that was the Lord initiating the supper before he died. Saying, I'm a new covenant. This cup is the cup of my blood. And this bread is my body which is being broken for you. But on the road to Emmaus was after the resurrection. Was it not? And they didn't even know it was him. Until they encouraged him to stay and eat. And it said, at the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened. And for me, I saw my life pass right before me when I saw in that scripture a process. And that was that Jesus was unrecognizable to them in his resurrected form. But it says he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. And their eyes were opened. And I said, you know, he did the same thing to David. He took David from the sheepfolds. He anointed him through Samuel. He blessed him. And then for years, he broke him. Being persecuted by Saul made him to be, you know, Jesus had 30 years developing his manhood for three years of ministry. We need to see more people in ministry develop the manhood first, ministry second. 
He wasn't even entitled, Jesus wasn't even entitled to his own ministry until the heavens opened and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's the affirmation you need. You need the voice of God. Not speaking to potential, but speaking to the making of the man. And I said, you know what? Jesus took me. He took me from, I was pastoring in the neighborhood as a baby Christian. And then he had me start a church. And then they had a cult researcher who attacked me and all my friends for 13 years. Those were probably the best, it's like a tale of two cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. He didn't like the prophetic. He didn't like it because I had friends in the faith camp. He didn't like it because in the 80s doing even prophecy and stuff was really, we had dance teams. He didn't like dance teams. You shouldn't be dancing in the church. You know, everything I did was wrong in 13 years he went, and I'm saying, and the Lord told me to shut up. And I say it was the worst of times and it was the best of times because I believe that that's the kind of breaking that is absolutely essential in making the man. Teaching you how to respond. Oh, there was a day of vindication came. 200 pastors were in a pastor's meeting. And... Dr. George Beninate from Pittsburgh and Dr. David Miner from Countersport had a prophetic word out of those 200 pastors and they picked on Dennis. And they knew nothing of the history. But this uh, so-called cult researcher basically was like 20-some years old trying to make a name for himself. He was prematurely bald and he wore a wig that was kind of obvious, not not to be demeaning, but like everybody knew it was a wig. But anyway, that's only to say this. David Miner and George Benedict had a prophetic word out of these two pastors. Pastor Dennis, stand up, please. And they says, from this day forward, it's over. It's a new day for you. And Korah and Abraham and Dathan, remember when they came against Moses? They says, I had three that came against me just two weeks prior to that. They had a list of 40 things I was doing wrong. Dancing in the church, uh, da, 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 they had a list. All, all stuff that everybody accepts. That's the weird part. But in the 80s, it was a little bit premature. And, and they went through this whole thing, and God says, you don't answer. You bless them. And I blessed them. And in this meeting, they said, Three people have come against you, like Dathan, Abiram, and um, Korah. Korah means, one of those names, I forget which it is even now, Korah. Korah means a balding one. And the, all of the pastors started snickering, and I didn't know what was going on. They're all laughing. They knew who we were talking about, all of them. They all had their dealings with them, because from our, all of our backgrounds were basically unacceptable, because we were Pentecostal, charismatic type people, so... Anyway, uh, they started snickering. And then he called me on the phone and said, how dare you mention my name? I'm going, I'm standing there crying. I didn't say a word. These people were prophesying to me. If the shoe fits, I figure wear it, you know. <laughs> Nobody mentioned names. But if a balding one kind of fit your tool, then wear it. From that day forward, it was like, the thing just fell apart. No longer, he no longer picked on anybody, really. Just gave it up. Figured. And I saw that there was the worst of times and the best of times. And I believe that what God is doing in the body of Christ, he's making ready a people prepared for what's coming. And he's going to take you. He's going to take you from the realm that you're in. And he's going to break you. But this breaking is not to harm you or to hurt you. This break you is to, for you to get to the place where you make a decision. Do you want God or do you want your way? All right? Those are the best years for David, was running from Saul. It taught him the character that was necessary for later on. So I just believe that God is going to take us. As we partake of this bread, he blessed it. And this bread represents my life, and it represents the life of Jesus, does it not? His life that was broken for me. 
that I might allow my life to be broken for him, to deny my flesh and to take the higher Christian life and walk it. Let's partake. And you know, after that life was broken, it says that Jesus broke the bread and then he gave the bread. I believe God has given us people like David who's still speaking to us and still ministering to us to this day in the scriptures, right? He broke him, but he gave him. I believe God is breaking us to give us to the rest of the body of Christ and to the unsaved to reach them. He's taking our life and he's taking that brokenness and letting his life shine through so that what we give them has value because it's him, not us. So Father, we just thank you that as we take this cup of the new covenant and we drink the cup representing the blood that was shed for us for not only the remission of sin but for to enter into the new covenant to walk in the light as you are in the light and to have fellowship and let that blood continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Open our hearts, Lord, to greater union and communion with the body of Christ. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you say that back to me? Amen. He took you, Amen. blessed you, Amen. broke you, Amen. but to distribute you, to give you your life, service for others, love one another. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.